Here are the most embarrassing moments on MasterChef that will leave you questioning if they really happened. Starting off with none other than Tyler. So, Tyler was all set to give his best, but something really unfortunate happened. I don't know if they got switched. I don't know. Okay. Chef, um... You didn't. Wait, was a home cook actually caught cheating in the MasterChef kitchen? Like, how bold do you have to be to even try something like that? Was it actual cheating or an honest mistake? Well, let's dive into it. So, Tyler was getting everything ready for his dish, and it looked like he was doing pretty good, honestly. I wanted to make sure that I got it in there and at least gave it enough time to set nicely. But that all changed when he presented Jamie's panna cotta to the judges, claiming it as his own. For context, Jamie had carefully prepared three perfect panna cottas and stored them in the fridge. When she went to retrieve them, there were only two. I don't know if somebody took it on accident or is trying to sabotage me. But we already know who's responsible, right? Whether it was an accidental mix-up or a deliberate act, it was squarely on Tyler's shoulder. Tyler, please, let's go. Three blindfolds, please. This was unprecedented in the history of the show, and Ramsey pointed out as much. Someone has brought us a dish that they did not cook. And the whole time, Tyler stood there, completely baffled, not understanding the gravity of the situation. What do you see on that tray, young man? My ramekins. Like, if you want to talk about embarrassing moments, well, there's a reason I picked this one first. I don't know if they got switched. I don't know, okay. Chef. Um, he didn't. Well, rules are rules. The judges needed to discuss the matter thoroughly before deciding on the appropriate action to take. Joe, Graham, and myself need a few seconds to catch up. Stay there. Ultimately, Tyler was disqualified from the competition. It was a harsh outcome, but I mean, come on. Any other outcome would have thrown the integrity of the competition out the window. But before leaving the MasterChef kitchen, Tyler had a few words to say. Sorry, I had no intent on doing that. I'm sorry that you grabbed mine. At least if they would have tasted it, it would have tasted pretty damn good. Was he genuinely remorseful or just upset he got caught? Well, I'll leave that to you to decide. But what happened with Richie was even more embarrassing. So, in episode 6 of season 13, Ramsey walked over to Richie and asked him what he was making. Honey spice cupcake with an apple filling on top and a tarragon whipped cream. Now, Richie, full of confidence, said he would be whipping up some delicious cupcakes. I'm on top of it, guys. I got you. I got you. I promise. Not gonna let you down again. All right. This means that everyone, including Ramsey and the rest of the judges, were expecting, well, cupcakes. Yeah, so we're all on the same page, right? Cupcakes. Cupcakes. Get those cupcakes in the oven. Thank yes. you so much. Good luck. But then things got pretty messy. Richie realized he forgot to add baking powder. Place when they should be rising. I'm not quite sure what it is at this point, but I can tell something's not right. And instead of just admitting his mistake, he decided to cover it up by calling them home cakes. Which, I mean, come on. Those aren't actually a thing. And calling it a home cake instead of a cupcake. Don't want the judges to have to eat this, but I have no choice. I literally Googled it and couldn't even find his in the results. So, yeah, 100% BS. And Joe called him out on it. Home cakes says so, they lost their levitation? No. However, in an attempt to save himself, he pulled about the lamest justification out of his ass as possible. They are playing with my grandmother's recipe. Well, Ramsey then asked Richie if he really wanted this dense texture for his home cakes. Well, of course, he had to lie again. Yeah, so that they could soak up that sauce. They didn't want them to be too soft. And but with that in mind, let's go back to the forgot part, shall we? No, think about it. Did you forget the baking powder, or did you want them to turn out dense? I mean, it can't be both. Also, let's break down his explanation for a bit. What was he even trying to say? That his grandmother baked without baking powder? That's her real recipe, as he claimed. Then he was basically throwing grandma under the bus to cover his own ass. So this was a nod to my grandmother. She used to make home cakes with no leavening. Honestly, it would have been so much better if Richie just owned up to his mistake instead of trying to cover it up with a lie. And let's be real, it wasn't even a good lie. Sadly for him, the judges weren't stupid. It was just ridiculous that he thought he could get away with such a weak excuse. They were meant to be placed underneath the sauce and then the sauce would soak it up. Now, keep in mind that all that was before they even tasted it. And yeah, they were about spot on with the texture. I mean, this, whatever it was, was a major letdown. Seriously, did he really think he could sell his sorry lie? 
Most traditional baking recipes, especially for modern era cakes, typically include a leavening agent like baking powder. That's just baking 101. The density and the weight of a rock, it's a fossil. I get it. Everyone makes mistakes. Maybe he was nervous. Maybe he genuinely forgot the baking powder in the chaos of the competition. People have definitely forgotten more important things, like rice for a rice pudding. Why not just tell the freaking truth? People are going to be much more forgiving when you're honest about your slip-ups. Instead, he opted for a cover-up. Now it's turned into a whole thing. Judges know what a cake without baking powder looks and tastes like. Trying to pass off a mistake is some secret family recipe is not only transparent, but also kind of disrespectful to the whole baking process. The recipe doesn't seem like it's on point. The actual apple's caramelized. Let alone grandma. If he had just been upfront, the judges might have appreciated his honesty. They might have given him some leeway, maybe even a bit of sympathy for the pressure he was under. It was really embarrassing, honestly. What this next contestant had to do wasn't any better. Remember how I said the whole baking powder fiasco wasn't the most embarrassing pantry blunder that the show has seen? Well, I wasn't kidding. Throughout her time on MasterChef season five, Courtney almost consistently impressed. What? There's a reason I said almost. This one episode had everyone on the edge of their seats, wondering if Courtney's luck had finally run out or if she had another trick up her sleeve. I want to take Courtney out of the competition. Why? Maybe because I go to high school and I deal with a lot of fake bitches all the time. The drama kicked off when Aaron, the winner of the previous challenge, got to pick the dish for the pressure test. And that decision could make or break Courtney's entire game plan. Well, whether it was fate or genuine strategy, he chose a dish that seemed to play into Courtney's weaknesses. As the challenge began, it was clear that Courtney was struggling. Her usually confident demeanor was replaced with a look of panic as she fumbled through the recipe. The judges watched closely, whispering among themselves about her chances of survival. But Courtney wasn't ready to give up yet. With the clock ticking down, she pulled herself together and started working with a new sense of determination. I'm so grateful. You met guys. So, what did she go for? <laughs> now, don't be fooled by their innocent appearance. Donuts are a dime a dozen snack here in the U.S., but just as Graham pointed out, they're very tricky to perfect. You have to get those toppings and fillings just right. They have to be beautiful. Yeah, there's a world of difference between good and great donuts. Anyway, the situation took a turn for the worse before long. Courtney instructed everyone to grab some yeast, which quickly drained the pantry of this essential ingredient. And as the realization set in that they were running out, it was clear that Courtney's error might jeopardize the entire batch of donuts. I'm screwed. I'm remaking my dough because I forgot to add eggs. I mean, no eggs in the dough and no yeast left. At that point, what the hell are we even trying to make here? Did you grab any extra yeast? No. Do you have any extra yeast? I'm basically shouting down the line. But wait. The worst part was yet to come. Donuts without yeast. I'm screwed. Francis, seeing that Courtney was in trouble, quickly spotted her some yeast. You might think, problem solved, right? Wrong. The real question was, could Courtney make something delicious even with everything going wrong? Well, Courtney was nothing if not determined, so she got to work. And well, she turned her bad situation into a chance to shine. Even though she had a rough start, Courtney did eventually make a batch of donuts. Raspberry frosted donut and a chai glaze on the other. Were they perfect? They looked good, I'll say that much. But when Ramsay took a bite, it was a different story. Please tell me you didn't put salt in and place the sugar. That is a mistake. Yeah, he spat it out like it was the worst thing he'd ever tasted. Uh. Let me tell you this, Ramsay's reaction after that, it was unforgettable. You lost your mojo. You won the last dessert challenge. Mm -hmm. Is that you now on the descent? What happened in this episode of MasterChef Canada is even worse. So the stage was set for a perfect harbor cruise wedding. Yeah, you know I had to throw in a wedding challenge episode here with the blue and red teams feverishly preparing their canapes. 
just as the festivities were about to kick off, disaster struck. The red team has a hair on it. Okay. A little bit disappointed. Michael rushed in, bearing the bad news that uh, apparently a guest had discovered a hair in one of the canapes. The guest found a hair in one of your canapes. Guess what the worst part was? It was found by none other than the bride. It was the bride. Oh my god. The gosh. bride. Isn't that a nice wedding gift? A hair. Despite the red team's efficiency in getting their treats out quickly, it became clear that speed wasn't everything. Quality was the name of the game here if they wanted to dig themselves out of this mess. They're winning for speed, but they're losing for quality. Below deck, the wedding guests settled in, oblivious to the drama unfolding above. After all, they were waiting for their fig appetizers to show up, so they were a little busy. Guys, we have to make up for lost time in that last service. Can somebody please grate the cucumber? Well, that was a pretty short and sweet one. And sometimes, it's the little things that are the most embarrassing. But now, let's head back to the States for season three of the OG show, where a certain someone was cooking up trouble even before starting to work on an actual dish. Now, during that season, Ryan became the center of attention, and not exactly for the best of reasons. So, what exactly went down? In one big line, please. Straight down, thank you. Well, Ryan made it his mission to be the most controversial and toxic contestant of that season. If ever there was a time to flash a nip, ladies. I'm not doing Dude. that. I don't know. Maybe he knew he was cooked already and just trying to shine the spotlight on himself for a little bit. After all, Christine Ha shared the stage with this guy and nobody's beating her. Anyway, this particular incident was a real bombshell. Ryan thought it would be a brilliant move to stir up drama by dropping some incredibly insensitive remarks. I'm not doing Dude, that. Dude, shut up. In all his misguided glory, Ryan joked that showing a bit of skin could actually help them earn more points with the judges. Ryan is telling me to show them your nipples. That'll get us more votes. Yeah, he really went there. Dude thought it would be a genius move to not only be a sexist piece of garbage, but also disrespect his female peers right in front of their faces. Now, how were they feeling about it? Have some f respect, man. I'm just kidding. They weren't about to let Ryan's nonsense slide, and who could blame them? They were quick to shut down his ridiculous comments, and rightfully so. See? Told you that the simple ones can be the most embarrassing. But what went down in Season 8, Episode 14 was a bit more complicated, and I gotta say, way more embarrassing. All of these home cooks right here are gonna be competing in teams of two. Yashika and Ebony faced a tough challenge together. Two loud voices may not sing together in harmony in the kitchen, so I'm choosing Ebony. They were tasked with making a Mexican platter, replicating every dish perfectly. Of Mexican food. At first, they seemed like a dream team, full of energy and working well together. But things went south before long. Come on, come on, come on, <laughs> Ebony, come on! Everyone thought they'd nail it. But as the clock ticked down, tensions rose. The pressure got to them. Their once happy partnership started cracking under the stress. She and I both have extra aggressive sister behavior. Lord help me, cause I'ma need it. The first signs of trouble were really hard to ignore. They were struggling to agree on how to even approach the dishes at a conceptual level. I don't think it's gonna be enough. Not too big. I don't think Ebony's very good at taking direction. <laughs> Then things got even worse. They couldn't keep up with the pace everyone else was setting, and that got both of them real frustrated. You gonna have to make that. I I'm got to try to do I'm this. just going down the checklist. Don't get frustrated. Their teamwork was practically falling apart. They were arguing more than they were cooking at this point. The fish. Oh my and god. The, uh, sloth. It's too much. It was clear that they were in trouble. The cracks in their partnership were now deep rifts. They were barely communicating, each doing their own thing without any coordination whatsoever. Despite their best efforts, it became clear that Yashika and Ebony's teamwork simply couldn't make the dream work. And it got more and more painfully obvious every second the clock ticked down. Tell her, no, whatever she doesn't get done right now is on your shoulder. And I mean, at the end of the day, it got really, really painfully obvious. Emphasis on the painful part. No, skip the ceviche. We gotta catch up. I gotta finish the ceviche though. When things couldn't fall into place, the tension finally reached a fever pitch. Oh. This is it. Three, two, two one. one. But eventually, the time finally came to actually present their platter. And even without looking at it, you could tell the two of them were thoroughly cooked. But actually looking at it, 
I mean, I imagine that all of the judges wanted to retroactively confiscate both of their aprons, regardless of how well either of them had done in the competition up to that point. Barehanded and be content. It's better than serving them dog crap. And Ramsey's reaction spoke volumes. What a mess. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that he was genuinely upset with the dish. As the pair scrambled to explain themselves, they started pointing fingers in every direction except towards themselves, which only made things worse. I had to try by myself. Absolutely not. Now, the moment of truth arrived as Ramsey prepared for his first bite. Say a prayer before I tuck into the because I have to taste this now. The second it went in, my god, he wished that he'd never taken it in the first place. Thank you for my sick bag. He was going to make sure both of them knew it. Ah, disgusting. It was clear that his discontent wasn't just about the dish. It may have been one of the worst dishes the show had ever seen, but it wasn't the worst. I'll let you debate about what that one may have been down in the comments, but the real issue here was that they just couldn't work as a unit. But here comes an entire service that went downhill real fast. Yeah, you thought these two were bad? Try an entire team doing the same damn thing. I'm talking about what happened in season 12, where this time, their mission was no piece of cake. The contestants had to cater to the appetites of the US Coast Guard. Imagine the pressure. Each team had to whip up a hearty meal for over 100 people. And the fact that they were hungry service people only made it more daunting. The blue team featured seasoned cooks from seasons one through seven, going head to head with the red team, composed of the relatively less tenured cooks from seasons eight through 11. Alejandro took charge of the red team, while Christian did the same for the blue team. The stakes were sky high, and the end was certain, as it usually is. Someone from the losing team was destined for elimination. So the red team launched with stakes, but hold on, turns out, Ramsey caught wind that they were dishing out cold cuts. The tray's cold, the steak's cold. I'm not gonna let you just send Not exactly the sizzling start they had in mind. Predictably, Ramsey wasn't thrilled. He ordered them to crank up the heat and in a crazy turn of events, shifted the Coast Guard over to the blue team so they'd actually get fed. They'd get fed over at the blue team, right? Right? Oh boy. Guys, we, we need mash. We have it's no coming. mash? Oh my god. The mashed potatoes were apparently still cooking. The only thing they were actually producing was Ramsey's anger. But despite the dumpster fire of a start both teams had, the initial feedback from the diners was surprisingly positive for both the teams. But when Ramsey was faced with yet another raw steak being served to the Coast Guard, he drove home exactly how unacceptable it was in no uncertain terms. He's not happy. But Alejandro was unfazed by Ramsey's unique spin on surf and turf. He scooped up some fallen steaks, tossed them back onto the grill, and voila, he was good to go. They're gonna get cooked. But the real shocker, he defended it, claiming what he did killed bacteria. And while he may have technically been right, it was the principle of the matter for Ramsey. And it was also on principle that Ramsey did this. You think I'm gonna keep you as a captain? You better have a meeting right now and Her. sort this out. Her. Well, here's hoping that the new boss will do a bit better than the old boss. Many viewers couldn't believe that Alejandro of all people was called back for another season. And on top of it, he made it to the top four, which is even crazier. And yeah, I'm totally with the peanut gallery on this one. Whether or not Ramsey actually wanted him on, that's not for me to say. But thank God he didn't end up winning either of his seasons, I'll tell you that much. But are you prepared to see the judges at their angriest? Have a look. When chaos erupted during an elimination round in season one. Now, I'm not one to joke around. Or, well, wait, I am actually. Anyway, believe me when I say this, things got wild in episode four, in no small part due to Jenna's antics. 
everything you pick up and put in that basket, think Chinese, through and through. So this episode was all about embracing the flavors of China. And this time, as the mystery box winner, Whitney had the power to choose the main ingredient for the competing chefs. She had to pick between Chinese mushrooms, oranges, or duck. And what did Whitney end up settling for? Is Mandarin oranges. Yeah, not everybody was happy with those mandarin oranges they were stuck with. And things hit the ground running as far as tension was concerned. Now, off you go. Get in the Chinese ball, baby, come on. And can you blame them? Chinese cuisine is no joke. It's not something you can master in just a day, much less an hour. Like, Ramsey himself was on the struggle bus when he tried to learn Chinese dim sum from the masters over on the F word. Another one of his shows. You know, let me know if you're interested in me covering that show in the future. Anyway, back to Jenna. A lot of sizzle, Jenna. What's going on? Uh, Asian orange stir fry. Uh, sure. Sounds fine, I guess. But would she be able to deliver? It's basically an orange chicken with the snap peas with the orange infused rice. So Jenna walked up with her orange stir fry, which like orange chicken, I get it. But that wasn't the issue here. You plated it up with 20 minutes to go. Right. And food dies as it sits in the window, clearly. Yeah, it had been a whole freaking 20 minutes since Jenna had plated her dish. And Ramsey was hoping that the dish wouldn't have dried out while sitting around at her station. Or like gotten stone freaking cold. And that had better taste phenomenal to put it up with 20 minutes to go. But here's where Joe comes in. He stepped up to dig in. And when he took a bite of what Jenna had the gall to put in front of him, well, you read the title of the video. This is the problem. Way to poke the bear, Jenna. After savoring the dish, Joe promptly dropped a bombshell as he looked over to the other contestants and gave them a fair warning. If you don't want to deliver on the highest level, if you want to play the game and be safe, you're not going to win this. Joe was clearly not a fan of Jenna's dish, and even went to the extent of calling it boring. With this whole round. Huh. I was expecting something a little more, I don't know, detailed. Like, where's the panache? Either way, Joe's anger was completely justified. I mean, you can't just plate any old dish and expect to get handed the prize money. But Joe was like a canary in the coal mine here. The other judges didn't even bother tasting it. <sighs> Meanwhile, Joe reminded the contestants of something crucial. We're trying to find the best amateur chef in America. The kid gloves had already been off, and they weren't about to put them back on. Get ready to bring it, and if you're not, you should probably just leave your apron and check yourself out right now. Damn, he laid it all out, didn't he? And Jenna stood there, processing the chaos she had unwittingly unleashed. It's not the spirit of what we came here to do. Joe's disapproval of her dish definitely made her question her abilities, but I guess that's Joe for ya. Now, this may have been one of the first times Joe dismissed a dish, but... It wouldn't be the last. Now, like Ramsey, Joe is known for his outbursts. They're a little less constructive, but I've already talked that topic to death and it isn't really relevant here. But I wanna focus on those silent death stares that are so filled with judgment. I'd say that's even worse than getting chewed out in my book. Technical error, raw garlic. You realize that? I... Let me get into it. During an elimination challenge, they brought Whitney Miller back into the kitchen the winner of season one. Whitney Miller! <laughs> she brought her cookbook with her too, and the contestants, including the star of this section, were in for a wild ride. Or at least Adrian was. Now, the deal was to replicate dishes from Whitney's cookbook. Crispy catfish. Jennifer scored a whole basket of ingredients to perfect her version of Whitney's catfish dish. As for Adrian and everybody else, they weren't so lucky. 
call it the winner's edge. 29 ingredients of Whitney's crispy catfish dish by looking and tasting alone. Anyway, as part of the challenge, all the contestants got to taste the dish. And soon after, they had 10 minutes of pantry time to get what they needed. Some were confident, like Christian strutting into the pantry like he owned the place. Others weren't too sure of themselves. Five minute trip to the pantry to replicate everything in the dish. Uh, well, Adrian was one of the confident ones. I'm feeling all right, doing pretty good. I gotta keep it simple the way I tasted it. Fast forward to the tasting and Adrian felt like he was on top of the world, but you wouldn't know that by that awful plating. I was so caught up in making sure that it tasted right that the plating just but hey, at least he was self-aware. The way Whitney plates it. There's nothing I can do. I'm just gonna have to take it. And turns out there was a reason, or well, excuse behind it. Thanks. Graham didn't even bother giving any feedback, but Joe wasn't gonna let him walk out of there unscathed on his watch. There's obviously another contestant who refuses to follow direction. I don't really understand. Yeah, he didn't even have to taste the dish to make that comment. But when he actually did... This doesn't taste great. It wasn't just about the taste. He simply couldn't fathom how things went so wrong. But turns out, he knew how to fix it. Or at least that's what he wanted everyone to believe. Because a few moments later, Joe pulled out a spare plate from below and started replating the dish all by himself. And you have to see how he did it. Let me win this contest for you, right? So you take this, put it here, like it was on Whitney's dish. And he kept going and going and going. Oh yeah, Joe really just dropped a 12 second masterclass on our guy here out of nowhere. And it definitely drew a whole lot of reactions from everybody including Ramsey. Meanwhile, Adrian was just standing there, completely stunned. Talk about adding insult to injury. But I mean, dropping a dish in need of some serious TLC was kinda just asking for a schooling, you know? But that was far from the only impromptu lesson Joe's handed out during his time on the show. And what happened in season two, episode 13, was a perfect example of that. Enter Susie. I definitely know that I don't have the top dish, but I'm really hoping Christine's dish is worse than mine. You know MasterChef always keeps it interesting. Or, well, tries. And this week's elimination challenge was no exception. <laughs> If you haven't guessed already, it's pork. Nine different cuts to be exact. And our girl Susie was ready to prove herself. Oh, he hates me. I got pork belly, holy <laughs> When she ended up with pork belly, she kinda deflated a bit. I'm not happy that I have to cook pork belly in one hour, not at all. Handling pork belly is no joke. And it ended up being a huge thorn in her side. When the tasting rolled around, just about everybody was at the top of their game. But as for Susie, not so much. Pork belly, uh, braised cabbage, and spetzel, as well as uh, a gravy. Ramsey's reaction honestly said it all. Mm. And the kind of spice she was slinging was far from what Ramsey expected and wanted. Quite possibly the worst sauce I've ever tasted. And oh no, he didn't stop there. Dog bits of crap stuck together with, you know, soft bits of spatula at the bottom. Okay, now let me break down this disaster from top to bottom for you. So Susie's dish had potential, but the sauce? Well, this is where she messed up. It ended up being so overly spicy and had a hell of a bitter aftertaste. One that, unfortunately, overstayed its already very short welcome. Now, given all this background, guess how things went when Joe got his hands on it. This show is called Master Chef, not Delusional Chef. Joe completely dropped the hammer here, but he also wanted to put Susie in her place. What do you know about German sauces and German cuisine? This is a freaking disaster. He was acting all high and mighty, and like she knew everything, but let's be real. In truth, 
she was clueless. Somehow even more clueless than Joe's sometimes been. And just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, Joe said something that ended up being a total game changer. It is awful. And if it doesn't send you home, probably should. Ever was a perfect image of disappointment? It'd be her face right then. Go, go back to school. Ugh. With every word those judges dropped on her, Susie's dream of winning the title seemed more and more distant. If Adrian's plan was to knock me out of the competition, congratulations, you just did it. But hey, can we talk about the fact that she didn't even try to own up to the disaster she'd wrought? I mean, come on. Despite her obvious mistakes, she went all out and blamed Adrian for her disastrous performance. And I mean, he was still reeling from what happened to him four episodes earlier. Like, way to kick a guy while he's down. The fact that she couldn't even muster a half-hearted apology was just... blah. It somehow tastes nastier than her dish probably did. <sighs> Alright, rant's over. For now, at least, because I've probably got a few more coming if these last few examples have been any indication. Now, if you ask me, I think season 3 of MasterChef had to be one of the wildest seasons ever. And episode 15 really solidified that. During the elimination challenge, yet another contestant came into the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. Corn and beans. Picture this. So, Josh was standing there beads of sweat forming on his forehead as the details of the task he was expected to nail were dropped in front of him. Still one of you will be making a dessert. But there was a catch. They had to make a dessert using something you could never imagine. Corn. Corn. Not exactly everybody's favorite cookie topping. Now, Josh was quite confident going into it, but it had all but drained away by the time he'd gotten through that nightmare of a challenge. Play with a corn-infused caramel. What you're looking at is corn creme brulee with corn caramel which to me had to have been doomed from the start. And Joe was of a like mind. He took one look at Josh's creation and, well, let's just say he wasn't impressed. I think we can all agree on that. But wait, there was more. But if you can believe it, that was just the presentation. If that was the long and short of it, we'd have another Adrian situation on our hands. But unfortunately for Josh, well, he wasn't so lucky. Way too sweet. Now, since things weren't exactly going in his favor, Josh tried to be smart and thought defending his dish would help him save face a little. I don't think it's terrible, though, but I mean, I think it's, it's very think it's ter I think it's terrible. But that kind of backfired real bad, unsurprisingly. It's you don't think it's terrible. I think it's terrible. That's really all that matters, right? Yeah, you're right. But when Joe made his disappointment crystal clear, Josh just wasn't convinced. Sent you home once. That's bad. And then Graham chimed in with his own set of remarks. Yeah. But it does not look appetizing. I just expect more from you. And it took this unlikeliest of tag teams to finally start breaking through Josh's shell. With every minute that passed, an ounce of criticism that was given, it was getting harder and harder for Josh to bear it. Because when it came down to the deliberations, Josh had his heart in his mouth. The judges had made their decision, and the three worst dishes of the night were called up. Josh was obviously in serious trouble, but Felix and David were here to keep him company at his darkest hour. So he had that going for him. For the rolls, Felix, I mean, those were so bad. As Josh stepped forward, ready to face his destiny, something unexpected happened. You are going back. Yeah, he survived. Turns out, even in spite of all the criticism they put him through, the judges decided to give Josh another shot. I mean, maybe they saw a glimmer of potential beneath the spit in the face of nature that was his dish, but whatever it was, Josh's reaction was priceless. A mix of disbelief, gratitude, and relief all at the same time. Maybe a little bit of panic in there too, considering how he was probably never going to be able to live it down. Josh. Gotta say, that was as narrow a miss as you could ask for. But for this next contestant, missing was a way of life for her. At least in this one particular challenge. 
I'm talking about the Pizza Stone Challenge of Season 3, Episode 10, when Tanya decided to stir the pot more than she probably intended to. If you paid any attention to her journey this season, Tanya had been cruising through the competition. She was honestly a hell of a frontrunner, discounting the elephant in the room here. But that's when things took an unexpected turn. That pizza stone she needed to use wouldn't take long to become her tombstone. The pressure is definitely on. Putting a dish on a pizza stone isn't super easy, unless you're making, well, pizza. But Tanya decided to tackle the challenge head on. But things didn't exactly get off on the right foot. When Ramsay pointed out a major issue with her ingredients during prep, Tanya was on the verge of breaking down. The lamb. It's still raw. Well, Tanya wasn't going to be given any second chances here. They've never done that before, and they'll never do it in the future. <clears throat> Foreshadowing. And Tanya was about to learn this the hard way. So cut to the time of the tasting, and Joe, well, take a guess. Lamb cutlets with roasted garlic yogurt and olive flatbread sounds like a winning combo on paper, but execution is key and Tanya's dish was far from where it needed to be. When Joe discovered whole cloves of raw garlic in Tanya's yogurt, any chances that she'd get out of this unscathed were practically dead on arrival. To which a fuming Joe asked her a rhetorical question. We're not here to eat raw flour or raw garlic. And if you think he stopped there, you're so wrong. To be almost kind of personally offensive. You understand that? Yes. And for the finishing move? Step up your cooking game. Oh man, believe me, he meant every word he said. He also advised Tanya to show a little respect for the competition. Like Jenna before her, you can't get away with putting out any old dish in the MasterChef kitchen. But Joe wasn't the only judge pissed off by her that night. Ramsay wasn't a fan of the dish, but he was still in MasterChef mode as far as his temper was concerned. But Joe practically could have been a stand-in for his Hell's Kitchen persona with how pissed he was. And things got so bad that the judges pulled a double elimination, which both she and Mike were on the receiving end of that night. Told you that she'd be earning her tombstone this episode, but that didn't mean her journey was done. Four episodes later, she managed to claw her way back into the competition when they brought back the last eight eliminated contestants. And while she put up a hell of a fight, she didn't have it in her to earn her apron back. Ooh, wait, didn't I say something about them not giving second chances? Well, here comes a season winner, yes, a season winner, whose second chance made all the difference. I'm talking about Courtney from season five. Like Tanya before her, she was one to watch out for that season. And considering she won it all, that should go without saying. So in episode four, she was up against the donut challenge, but things were gonna be a lot more sour than sweet. Or, well, salty. Things hit a snag right from the start as Courtney forgot a crucial ingredient. I'm remaking my dough because I forgot to add eggs to it. Eggs! But that's not the only thing she missed out on. Don't have any yeast. Elise, did you grab any extra yeast? This left Iran wondering what in the world she was up to. For donuts? Then you're kind of sad and you should go home. Anyway, the show must go on. Courtney hustled to rectify her mistake, pulling out all the stops, even resorting to some sweet talking to grab some yeast that was lying around. She practically canvassed the entire kitchen, hitting up every contestant in sight, but no one stepped up to lend a hand, except for this one dude. But you have the whole kitchen in here. Do you have any extra yeast? <gasps> Francis, the sweetest guy you'll ever meet. Major props, dude. Anyway, despite busting her butt in the kitchen, things took a nosedive during the tasting. As seems to be a theme this video, Ramsay took one look at the plate, and he was lost for work. Wow. And when he finally sliced into it, from the outside, the donut had that perfect, crispy exterior. But once he took a bite, it was a whole different story. Salt. They're salty. That's seriously salty. Salt. 
I'm not even kidding. Salt! This aired years ago and I'm still not over it. I mean, how careless can you be? First you forget the eggs, then the yeast, and even the freaking sugar? I mean, what am I supposed to even say here? But I mean, there had to be an explanation, right? Picked everything up and kept going, and that I didn't give like up. Your... Graham didn't hold back either. He straight up said that Courtney's donuts were like biting into rocks, nowhere near airy or fluffy enough. Like, imagine expecting a soft, pillowy cloud of donut goodness. But instead, you get this heavy, dense thing that'd better serve you as a paperweight. That's how far off it was. But it was Joe Bastianich who delivered the harshest blow. He couldn't fathom how Courtney managed to mess up such a simple dish. It had to have happened when I was just rushing to get... But then he dropped this comment that hit her like a ton of bricks. It's hard for me to even like them. I'm sorry, Chef. No points for guessing that Courtney was handed a first-class, all-expenses-paid trip into the danger zone that night. Bit of a surprise. Courtney. In the end, it was Kira, who was nominated alongside her, whose fate was sealed instead, sparing Courtney from elimination by the skin of her teeth. Courtney, please put your apron on your bench. The time is done. She had to have been thanking her lucky stars that one chef's lack of passion was all the difference between her going home in episode four and her winning the whole damn thing. Think that was unbelievable? Just wait until you see when things actually got physical. And first up is the passion fruit challenge. And let me tell you, they really put the passion in passion fruit this time around, for better or worse. So enter Slim, the queen of Asian cuisine, thinking she had this one in the bag. Little did she know, though, that things were far more out of her control than she'd bargained for. If it was in anybody's hands, it was in those of Joe Bastianic. I'm sure you can see where this one is headed. This is actually a um, sweet and savory dish with um, lamb, shrimp, and fresh fruit. Yeah, he threw Slim's dish into the trash without tasting or offering any constructive criticism, feedback, or comments in general. Buffet gone bad. Go back to your station. I'm not tasting this crap. And yeah, this was where the legend of the infamous Joe the Trash Man Bastianich started. I know I've already talked about some of the crazier trash tossing incidents, but believe me, it threw everyone out of whack at the time. You need to be listening to what we're telling you about what we're producing because this is ridiculous. I mean, considering it's Joe we're talking about, you'd think that this one wasn't anything out of the ordinary. Pretty banal by his standards too. But there's two things that made this one special. One, it was the first, and two, people decided to take it out of context. They made it a cultural thing. From there on, the clash of culinary cultures became a central theme in Slim's MasterChef journey. While her proficiency in Asian flavors was impressive, the competition, and especially Joe, demanded versatility. And by versatility, he meant Italian. Either way, the Passion Fruit Challenge revealed Slim's struggle with non-Asian cuisines and highlighted a significant gap in her culinary repertoire. To make things worse, that incident and everything that swirled around it set the stage for a turbulent journey ahead. In my kitchen, we would spend six to eight hours trying to get a stock like that. You've done it in one hour and you didn't serve it. Are you crazy? As the competition progressed, Slim had bigger fish to fry than passion fruit. The challenges were only getting more diverse, and the more they did, the more she started running into trouble. I don't like it. Yeah. I, I just you don't like, like chili? No, I do not. Maybe it's time to start. And soon, Slim found herself struggling to keep up. And then, everything reached a boiling point. If by boiling, you mean ignoring the judge's advice altogether. It was that that put the nail in her MasterChef journey's coffin. The birth of Joe's legend aside, the demand for more than Asian flair, and Slim's issues with adaptability all played a role in her departure from the competition. Surely everyone that came after her would learn from her mistakes and be more open to other cultures' ideas, right? Right? Well, anyway, in season five, Corey found himself in a storm of his own making when he presented a dish featuring fried chicken and a side of potato souffle. However, Ramsey was about to end his whole career. 
Here we have fried chicken with sauteed spinach with a potato souffle. As Corey nervously placed his creation before the judges, Ramsey raised an eyebrow at the sight of the rustic fried chicken paired with a delicate potato souffle. Safe to say, he doubted that this guy had the slightest idea what he was doing. It's a play on the souffle. As a golden rule in cooking, you never play with a souffle. But in the blink of an eye, the sound of shattering porcelain echoed through the MasterChef kitchen, freezing everyone in their tracks. But it's what he said next that was the biggest stab in the back. I broke the plate, my apologies. Um, the dish was broken way before that. Undeterred by the broken plate, though, Ramsey decided to grab a fork and eat through the scattered shards. I mean, surely a little bit of shattered porcelain wasn't going to stop him from laying down the law, right? Gosh, this man always figures out a way to surprise me. Up next, Luca Menfei's journey in season four was nothing short of remarkable. From the get-go, he not only showcased his culinary skills, but also his determination and resilience in the face of challenge. The more Luca demonstrated his passion for cooking and his ability to think creatively under pressure, his victory in the competition solidified his place in the culinary world and marked the beginning of an exciting chapter in his career. But that didn't mean he didn't hit a few stumbling blocks along the way. The biggest challenge the guy faced that I can think of was during a restaurant challenge where contestants had to cook in a professional kitchen under the watchful eye of none other than Ramsey himself. You're falling behind, guys! Come on, Luca. We need them patties. Facing a tight time constraint, Luca had a decision to make serve a raw burger, or come up empty-handed. Now, the right decision might seem obvious on paper, right? Well, it may not have been so obvious while Luca was in the thick of it. Three, two, one, Luca! But as you can probably guess, Ramsey's initial reaction was one of disbelief, and perhaps even amusement at the audacity of the move. No, no, just touch it. It's it off. Look at it. It's still moving. It's that raw. You know... If Fox starts selling t-shirts with that quip on it, I'll be the first in line. Now, you might not know it just based on this clip alone, but Luca's eventual victory was a testament to his talent, perseverance, and ability to thrive under pressure. By the way, aside from winning the coveted MasterChef trophy, Luca also earned the opportunity to publish his own cookbook, allowing him to share his unique culinary perspective with the world. But don't worry. There are no burger a la tartare recipes in there. Pinky promise. But here comes an incident from season three that sparked outrage and brought the issue of misogyny and disrespect towards women in the culinary industry out of Hell's Kitchen where we're all used to seeing it and straight into MasterChef. So I'm talking about what happened during a military-themed cooking challenge. Whenever there was a time to flash a nip. Ladies. I'm not doing Dude, that. shut up. You know Ryan, the jerkwad with the biggest ego that season? Well, he decided to ditch the cook and resorted to making a highly inappropriate and demeaning comment towards his fellow contestant Monty instead. Can you believe that he actually urged her to flash the judges after they had finished tasting the food? Like, I don't think I need to tell you how downright nasty it is to ask a woman to expose herself in a professional setting, let alone at all. Dude had some serious screws loose to think that was a good idea to say. But thankfully, Monty was no shrinking violet. Ryan is telling me to show them your nipples. That'll get us more votes. I mean, that had to have been so cathartic for her to finally get years of frustration due to blatant sexism off her chest. Uh, no pun intended. Sorry, too soon. Still, she was 100% in the right here, and I'm glad she had the stones to put Ryan on blast about it. But she wasn't the only one putting in the work. Somebody on Reddit pointed out how completely backwards Ryan had to have been to get annoyed when everyone got mad at him after he said what he said. I'm surprised the judges let it slide. Maybe they just didn't hear what he said properly? Though, the real thing that shocked me is how it made it to air in the first place. For the drama, sure, but I don't think the show itself really did as much as it should have to lambast him over it. But that's just my take. 
I could be entirely off base here, so keep me honest down in the comments, I guess. Anyway, with that, let's move on to this next contestant who knew far too well how to manipulate people. So Sean O'Neill's journey to victory in season seven of MasterChef was in no small part due to a perfect balance of strategic gameplay, culinary prowess, and a keen understanding of his competitors' weaknesses. Now, you might call it a skill, but to me, it just felt kinda slow easy to watch sometimes. Throughout the competition, Sean demonstrated his ability to leverage his advantages and exploit everyone else's vulnerabilities to secure his path to the top. I got some rice, I got some ginger, and a lot of other surprises. Is this some packaged smoke trap, Dan? <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind if we're talking about Sean's strategic acumen came during a certain challenge. Specifically, one where he received a significant advantage over his fellow contestants. As part of this advantage, Sean had the opportunity to choose ingredients for his basket. Saying he had the upper hand here would be an understatement. However, his competitor Dan managed to throw a wrench in Shaw's plans by handing him a basket filled with absurd and unconventional items. This left Sean with a lack of protein and seemingly a bleak outlook for his dish. Only protein? Yep. Oh, you made my job easy. Despite the setback, though, Sean remained focused and capitalized on Dan's strategy. Guess what he did? He recognized that fellow contestant David was prone to frustration and knew that he could exploit this vulnerability to gain an advantage. It's a pretty bleak basket. There's not a lot in there. This one's going to David. See, Sean strategically played on David's emotions, aiming to throw him off his game and increase his chances of success. My main goal today is to throw David off his game, get him so flustered that he cannot come back from it. His cutthroat tactics became evident as he deliberately worked to unsettle David during the challenge. By remaining calm and composed himself, Sean contrasted David's escalating frustration and agitation. He knew that if he could provoke David into making mistakes, or losing focus, it would improve his own chances of winning the challenge. And guess what? It worked. <laughs> As Sean's little pokes and prods got more intense, David really started losing it leading him to make personal comments and even resort to profanity directed at Dan for his role in the unconventional ingredient selection. Sean's calculated manipulation had succeeded in derailing David's focus and causing him to lose control of his emotions, ultimately undermining his performance in the challenge. You're an idiot. Idiot. Some may view Sean's tactics as ruthless or unsportsmanlike. You can't say he wasn't willing to win by any means necessary. No, I mean, this idiot doesn't even get protein and then I get this and he <laughs> up. No, it's David, you okay? Not at all. And you also can't say he didn't deserve it. Manipulation alone didn't get him to the top. He ultimately had to win the final cook-off just like anyone else. And hey. I suppose strategic gameplay and psychological warfare can often be just as important as technical skill and creativity in the kitchen. But again, keep me honest on this one. I'm honestly conflicted about this one, considering my opinion at the top of the section and the one I came to at the bottom. But here comes another moment of majorly clashing egos, one that really came out of left field. Yep, I'm talking about Elizabeth and Leslie. And when I said that this was so sudden and unexpected, I honestly mean it. I've never said anything to you, Elizabeth, never once. You wanna get ugly, let's get ugly. Well, digging into it, it all started with Elizabeth's talkative nature. While some might find her banter endearing at the time, it grated on the nerves of her fellow competitors. However, in this case, the exchange quickly escalated as Leslie chimed in with some criticism of his own. Oh no, he wasn't ready to take shit from her. Leslie made it a point to remark about Elizabeth's chatter, suggesting that it was hindering the team's progress. Elizabeth, feeling defensive, retaliated by shushing Leslie. Which, I mean, come on, use your words if you don't want to look that disrespectful. But of course she didn't, and things got personal super fast. Leslie defended himself by asserting that he had worked hard, implying that he had earned his place in the competition fair and square. But Elizabeth wasn't about to let him off the hook. She launched a targeted attack at Leslie by insinuating that he didn't contribute financially because his wife worked. Oh, I worked so hard to get where I am. Obviously your wife works and you don't. 
Like seriously, that was 1000% unnecessary. You see, for Elizabeth, it was more a matter of trying to assert herself in a male-dominated environment. Sort of like Monty, but entirely unjustified this time around. I worked my ass off. You know what work is? Okay? Please no, no. And for Leslie, it was a challenge to his pride and dignity. You don't know where the hell I've been. You f live in Malibu. Oh. And to me, well, like I said, it really gave the cause she was fighting for a bad name. Anyway, as the argument reached its peak, fellow contestants looked on with a mixture of fascination and discomfort. And I gotta say, I was right there with them. Spiritually, at least. Speaking of pressure, though, here comes a challenge where the blue team decided to snub the red team in the worst way they could think of. So what happened is, the blue team was en route to an easy victory thanks to their impressive organization skills. The team was in absolute sync as they delegated tasks, chopped up ingredients, and prepped their dishes with complete focus. Look at the organization. He's banging out seven, eight portions at a time, and look, at this bombshell. Meanwhile, over on the other side of the kitchen, the red team wasn't anywhere near as coordinated. The contestants were literally fumbling through every step of their preparation, all the while making frantic attempts to salvage whatever time they had left. And that strategy definitely isn't one that has or will ever work in MasterChef. In a desperate bid to catch up, they turned to the blue team, hoping to borrow some of their momentum. But guess what? Just as the red team reached out, things turned up to 11 in a heartbeat. Monty was losing her cool as she hurried to finish her dish. But just then, she did something that ticked Ramsey off. Monty! Yes, sir! You're not throwing that floor. Look at her, madam. Look. It was a display of pure frustration. The mounting pressure and anxiety was getting to her, but that didn't excuse it in Ramsey's eyes. This is the kitchen. Yes, We're not cooking Cowboys now. The secret to dealing with pressure is by firing back with calmness and collectedness. You just can't let it get to your head or you're only going to make it worse. But just as Monty was starting to get things in order, over in the blue kitchen, disaster struck. Every time you put plastic on the stove, what happens? It melts. Yeah, Ramsey actually had to intervene and teach him an important lesson. Plastic melts on contact with heat. Who would have guessed, right? Well, it was embarrassing for sure, but a little embarrassment has never gotten Ramsey to back down before. Not only will we lose the mission star, we'll burn the place down. Right, let's not do that then, bro. Yeah, concentrate. I mean, this dude literally could have set the whole kitchen on fire. Although the contestants followed Ramsey's orders and immediately got back on track, the man couldn't help but make one final comment. Shrek right now. Composure, okay? Yeah, Shrek. Yeah, no one can do it better than him. Well, all that being said, can you think of more times when things went wild on MasterChef? I know, you know, and I know you know that wasn't all of them. So you know what to do. Get in the comments or get in touch with me on my social media pages with what you want to see next. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And don't forget to check out this next one I've got lined up for you here. It's even crazier.